In this lesson, what we're going to do is talk about the philosophy of the uh, pre-Socratic philosopher Empedocles. Now, we've been going through all the different pre-Socratic philosophers um, for the last few lessons, for the last nine or ten lessons, I believe, so far. We are nearly at Socrates himself, so we've only got a couple more to go. But the ones that we're going to be talking about now are uh, much more significant in terms of their impacts on philosophy. So while we can say, for example, that Zeno had a certain amount of impact on philosophy, of course people like Heraclitus um, having a somewhat of an impact on um, philosophy, people like Empedocles and um, people like Democri uh, Democritus, um, uh, and people like Socrates, of course, will have a much more substantive impact on how we understand philosophy to this day. And so we're going to spend a bit more time on these philosophers. And then, of course, we're going to spend a, a multiple series of lessons on Socrates and Plato and Aristotle uh, before we move into the sort of post-Aristotelian philosophy that we can examine in the ancient world as well. So according to uh, Anthony Kenny, who is a renowned um, historian of philosophy who's written many books on the history of western philosophy um, according to anthony kenny empedocles is the quote most flamboyant of the early philosophers of greek italy now the life of empedocles is very interesting as well because he came from an aristocratic family a lot a lot like some of these other philosophers and he himself spent a lot of time involved in the world of politics. You may remember that some philosophers were less um, inclined to be involved in um, in political debate and in the sort of in the world of politics itself. Empedocles was not one of those individuals. Empedocles was somebody who was very interested in uh, and very keen to involve himself within political life. He was even allegedly uh, offered the position of king at one point in his life, but he decided to turn it down, preferring to embark uh, in the world of philosophy and continue to work as a counsellor. So he's a really um, somebody who uh, allegedly turned down the power of king to become a philosopher, uh, which is a very interesting choice if, you, if I do say so myself. Now, of course, just like with all the ancient philosophers that we can talk about, some of these um, may be um, spurious tales, some of these may be apocryphal tales, not all of them are necessarily uh, bona fide in truth, um, but yeah, allegedly offered to become king at one point in his life. Empedocles was also a physician, famously claiming to have drugs to ward off old age and have the knowledge of mystical spells that would allow him to control the weather so again this just does this little quote here ties into the fact and really um, gives us a little bit more of an indication of the kind of things that were considered to be uh, within the remit or within the scope of somebody who was a philosopher we remember that uh, there was not really much of a distinction between philosophy and science for example at the time of um, the ancient world there tend to be a, a much more of a, a connection between the sort of words that would be spoken by a philosopher and those that were spoken by somebody who was interested in cosmology. A similar thing can be said about the kind of physician of Empedocles and the mystical knowledge that he said to have had um, that allowed him to allegedly control the weather. And just like other thinkers before him, Empedocles wrote uh, in a number of different uh, ways. One of them was uh, through poetry. The poem uh, famously uh, attributed to Empedocles is titled On Nature. And On Nature and Purifications is the uh, much... Um, uh, are, the, are the two poems, uh, sorry, side by side. And supposedly... This poem was very, very long, containing around 2,000 lines. Unfortunately, though, much of the poem no longer exists. We only have around 20% or a fifth of the fragments from the poem that remain. The second poem that we have uh, mentioned here, um, titled Purifications, was more of a religious poem which, again, only small amounts of the fragments survive to this day, unfortunately. Uh, but Purifications, uh, because it is more of a religious poem, this does touch on one of the things that Empedocles is known for, which is his introduction to, or at least his contributions to, the philosophy of religion, and a little bit more theological implications and interpretations of philosophy as well. Something that is touched on by other philosophers but you might remember that when we've been talking about people like 
Thales and Anaximander and, and Zeno and, and, and Heraclitus, we haven't really been mentioning in any great significant detail the impact that religion had on these philosophers. But that's because religion within the fragments that we know didn't really serve much of a purpose. But with Empedocles, there's a lot more of a religious bent to his work. On top of his work, uh, when it came to the writing of poetry, Empedocles was also a more general, prolific writer. According to Aristotle, he wrote a, a literary epic on the Persian invasion of Greeks. And just like philosophers who came before him, he seemed to have um, followed some of the early traditions of the early Ionian philosophical beliefs. So if you think when we go into all of these um, different philosophical beliefs, just keep in mind all of the philosophers that we have examined previously. And you will come to some kind of idea as to the kind of things that, um, that Empedocles uh, took from other philosophers in the past. So he, he didn't just uh, come up with his own ideas in themselves, just like with every other philosopher um, that existed within this sort of early Ionian um, pre-Socratic era, we see that Empedocles has taken from and, and added to the conversation, to the traditions of the philosophy that we are seeing. So as we already know from previous lessons, Different pre-Socratic philosophers believed in a whole host of different things relating to uh, what we would describe today as the fundamental elements. So, for example, we knew that Thales believed that water was the fundamental element of everything. According to Heraclitus, it was fire that was the fundamental element of everything. Other philosophers believed that air was the most fundamental element or earth uh, was the most fundamental element. Well, according to Empedocles and uh, a bit of a break from some of the other ideas that we have talked about. Um, Empedocles believed that the four fundamental uh, fundamental elements often that are often cited by the pre-Socratics, so for example, um, water, air, fire, and earth, they all played an important role in the nature of all things, according to Empedocles. So he believed that these were the four fundamental, quote, roots of the universe, not necessarily um, any individual one having any meaningful sense of being fundamental in and of themselves. It should be considered that all of them together are the fundamental roots of the universe. Now, the idea being, according to Empedocles, that these fundamental roots, as they are described, would mix together and create all things that exist in reality to this day. So the idea of these roots of elements that come together to form um, to form the, the works and to form reality to this day um, were translated from Plato into the later word elementum. Now, it is from here that we derive the word element in our modern understanding of science. So, of course, we can draw a direct link between the, the, the word elementum in this particular uh, instance that is translated from Plato or that is uh, attributed to Empedocles to the word element that we use when we are talking about the periodic table or we're talking about chemistry in, in our modern parlance. And so it's quite interesting that the belief in fundamental elements that is adopted by Empedocles um, would be used by philosophers and scientists for the rest of the classical period, going through the sort of medieval period and into the early modern period of history. It wasn't until the 1600s that our attitude towards the concept of reality being built from these fundamental elements would start to shift and change a little bit. And then, of course, with the scientific revolution uh, and and the introduction of things like uh, the work of Mendeleev, for example, when it came to the development of the periodic table. Obviously, at that point, we start to see a departure from um, Empedocles' um, pre-Socratic philosophy. But just as I've said at the start of this lesson, when I mentioned that these philosophers will have such a, an enormous impact on the way in which we understand philosophy, and in fact, we understand science as late as the 1600s, I wasn't, I wasn't exaggerating. And Pericles um, would uh, fundamentally change the way in which we understand reality up to the 1600s. And just like with all of the other uh, pre-Socratic philosophers, as I mentioned, they 
Empedocles was also known to have cosmological theories. So he did not just establish a theory of cosmology that justifies the existence of the fundamental elements of the universe, but he also is the first of the pre-Socratic Ionian philosophers to develop a theory as to the causes for the mixing of said elements to create the natural world around us. Again, we can talk about the fact that Empedocles adds to the tradition of the Ionian philosophy of the pre-Socratics, adds to this conversation that is being had and that is being developed between all of these early philosophical thinkers. But we should also note that not only is he, on the one hand, adding to this tradition and adding to this conversation, but he is also representing a significant departure from the beliefs that had been previously established. First, in the idea that the four fundamental elements are not um, any one of them being um, significantly uh, more fundamental than the other uh, than the other three, but rather that they are all um, impactful in creating the roots of the universe. Similarly, within that regard, in terms of his cosmology, he talks about the idea of the causes of particular uh, things that take place. So, for example, giving uh, an example of this, um, elements um, are caused to come together through love, apparently, according to Empedocles, and that they are caused to break apart as a result of strife. Under this system um, of this kind of dialectical um, uh, distinction between love and strife, objects in the world would be formed out of the fundamental elements, but then they are also said to be broken apart by the same fundamental elements. His system of, um, of love and strife also contributes to Empedocles' um, history, uh, sorry, the philosophy of history, which is something that is also new within the pre-Socratic tradition. So, when it comes to the philosophy of history, for Empedocles, history is believed to be a cycle whereby during a certain period we have the two causes that exist, we have love and strife, but over a period of time love might become more dominant as a cause, which causes the fundamental elements to come together to create and to develop in reality. And then during other parts of the um, of the cycle of love and strife, strife is said to be more dominant, causing things to break apart, causing the fundamental elements to 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 distinguish between each other, to break and to um, and, and to uh, and to essentially destroy in that regard. And what this means is that all things in nature, according to Empedocles, are actually temporary, since we can explain history and we can explain historical development through this life cycle, through this um, challenging of dualistic um, ideas between love and strife, coming and going between love and then between strife, between creation and destruction, between coming together as the part of the fundamental elements and the fundamental elements breaking apart part. And as I mentioned, finally, at the uh, start of this lesson, uh, we are going to talk a little bit about the theological interpretations that had been developed by Empedocles. This is probably the first time, I think, that we are um, talking about the impact of theology on the uh, philosophy of these thinkers. Of course, when we start to talk about um, the impact of Christianity and Judaism and Islam on, th on philosophy, of course, we cannot describe the history of philosophy especially in the middle ages without talking about the impact of religion but for the pre-socratic philosophers religion wasn't necessarily as important as it, as their other beliefs so this is something that is interesting in the in the in the impact of empedocles on philosophy on the one hand his theological interpretations are very, very interesting as they are relatively unique in the tradition of the pre-Socratics. But on the other hand, they're also difficult for us today, for philosophers today, because in terms of trying to interpret what, uh, uh, what um, Empedocles is saying, we have to try and um, disconnect the theological from the non-theological. And that is very, very difficult to do with the very few fragments that we have. 
At some point, um, Empedocles' explanations of the universe uh, and the way in which he explains the roots of the fundamental elements is deeply mechanical in nature. It's deeply physical. It's deeply scientific. We would probably um, categorize it if we're if we're going to talk about the sort of taxonomy of these things. We could categorize it as being um, something that exists in the realm of physics and cosmology. But then at other points, similarly, uh, within similar passages of the fragments that we have, Empedocles will make reference to deeply spiritual and deeply religious sentiments instead. And so when we are describing the fundamental elements, he would sometimes talk of them as being deeply mechanical, as, de as being the roots of reality and talking about this um, mechanical um, nature of love and strife and the dialectical um, conflict between these two different uh, different causes he would talk about them in a mechanical way but he would also sometimes refer to the fundamental elements using the greek gods so he would describe the fundamental elements instead of being um, fire earth air and water he would describe them as zeus hera uh, idonius and nestis so we have a problem with this in this regard because it's difficult in some regard to be able to distinguish between the theological and the non-theological aspects of Empedocles's philosophy. But to to that is to that extent, it is it is not necessarily too dissimilar to the ways in which theology and religion will impact philosophers for thousands of years as we go into the modern period where we start to look at the church fathers and we start to look at the christian doctrine and the impact of the christian doctrine on philosophy of course we will be very um we'll, we'll be stuck when it comes to trying to interpret the theological and the non-theological in that regard the final thing i want to touch on uh, is not necessarily the philosophy of Empedocles, but is the story of his death. So the story of his death is actually quite interesting in terms of um, how it has um, been able to pass down um, in terms of uh, our colloquial understandings. So for those who have never studied philosophy or ancient philosophy, you might have actually heard of the death of Empedocles because it is um, quite rooted in the culture of, uh, or, or at least in Western culture. Um, but it's also quite interesting in the sense that it is um, almost heroic uh, as the death of Empedocles is described. According to the legend, it should be noted that this is legend, okay, um, Empedocles had miraculously healed a woman called Panthea. So, uh, again, tying into this uh, mysticism that is surrounding Empedocles, his beliefs in having the ability to cure um, various uncurable ailments and also being able to mystically control the weather, don't forget. Um, he had he had miraculously healed a woman called Panthea. And after a night of celebrations as a result of healing this um, uh, this woman called Panthea, Empedocles heard his name being called from the heavens. He climbed Mount Etna and then decided to jump in the volcano. That is, according to the legend, the death of Empedocles. Now, there's a very famous quote from, I believe it's Paradise Lost, um, that, that references this um, as well. Um, I'll put that quote in the description down below. I thought I had it in this presentation here, but we'll put it in the uh, I'll put it down in the description below. But it is very interesting, um, the death of Empedocles. Now... In another lesson, in the next lesson, we're going to talk about uh, another one of these pre-Socratics. We've only got a couple more to do before we actually get on to the sophists and we start to talk about Socrates, the life of Socrates, the philosophy of Socrates and the death of Socrates and the impact that Socrates has as we sort of transition from his beliefs into the beliefs of his student, obviously that being um, Plato.